Good afternoon. I'm George Shenson. My name is Amol Tranker. And we're going to talk to you a little bit about our vision for MUSE, an open networked information ecosystem for medical education. Now, this is the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, one of the world's greatest ecosystems. Recent reports of its demise, thanks to climate change aside, this natural wonder exists because of communal interdependence and cooperation among more than 6,000 species of fish, coral, and other aquatic life. We wondered, what if medical education had such collaboration? To chart a course toward a collaborative ecosystem for the future of medical education, we began by asking ourselves a very simple question. Where are we now? Specifically, we started by identifying the pain points, the difficulties and frustrations we see in our everyday lives as participants in medical education. By understanding the landscape of medical education today, we can define the factors that create a need for a new paradigm in physician training. And we are not alone. All of you here at Medicine X have witnessed these pain points at your institutions on a broader scale. It is why you're all driven to be here, to in turn make a difference. First, medical education is slow to evolve and adapt. Even in the age of email and social media, our preferred method of sharing innovations in biomedical science or clinical practice is to send it to someone else and ask them to publish it. By the time an idea emerges from behind the paywalls, slowly disperses, and becomes familiar enough and accepted enough among educators to be presented in an undergraduate medical education lecture hall, on average, 17 years have elapsed. 17 years, that's a whole gap, a whole generation, between when we identify the best ways to deliver care and when we train students to apply them. It's no wonder, then, that many of the innovations in medical education that have been celebrated in academic circles, uh, sorry, um, and popular media in recent years, such as learning in interprofessional teams, applying data science to patient care, and using electronic, electronic medical records, are concepts that have been discussed in research reports and white papers since the 1990s. The science and delivery systems are advancing faster than we can teach them, and that's a problem. Second, innovations in medical education are siloed. As institutions, we're all thinking about innovations in curricular design, but we're often thinking and operating with our, within our own walls rather than across them. When we have good ideas, we build them within our own institution, then wait until a publication or a conference to share them. Curriculum development is largely a local process rather than a networked endeavor, and this is a major barrier to curricular innovation. To illustrate this, we ran a quick Google search. In under five minutes, we found five slide decks from five medical schools all about anemia, all strongly similar in content. For a moment, think about how long it takes you, as a medical educator, to develop a lecture and build its supporting materials. Now extrapolate that and imagine the energy expended by 140 schools to build 140 lectures on every topic in every specialty across a four-year education. Can't we do better than that? And finally, medical education remains primarily a passive process a lecture-centric knowledge transfer between a speaker and an often inactive listener. Now, this is for several reasons, including the relative novelty of active learning as a concept in education research and the deeply rooted historical precedence in higher education of teaching by lecturing. But one reason why passive learning persists in the face of an emerging body of literature that, uh, that active learning better fosters critical application and retention is that it remains a time and cost-intensive process to implement. Changing a slide deck into activity or a case discussion is hard. It takes time and energy that educators often don't have, and one has to wonder if the redundancy of building identical curriculum materials in parallel contributes to that problem. So we've outlined a landscape of medical education that's slow, siloed, and dependent on passive pedagogies. But it doesn't have to be this way. And for our students' sake, we can't keep letting it be this way. So together, let's chart a path forward. Let's ask ourselves, what does the future of medical education look like? Luckily, that's not a question that we have to ask entirely in the abstract, because the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. If we look to industries and disciplines beyond medicine, we see the extent to which we've been left behind, but we also see the ways that we can close that gap. We can see that we've if we look to the industries beyond medicine, we can see that we're behind. We look at the tech sector, we're all here in Silicon Valley, and we look to platforms like Twitter and Reddit, where innovative ideas diffuse instantly. We look to Wikipedia or GitHub, 
where people don't develop content in isolation, but work together for iterative design of a shared product. We can look to Coursera or Khan Academy, where the exchange of information isn't restricted behind academic paywalls, but openly shared in a global classroom. In the digital age, we've seen a revolution in how we access information, share resources, and collaborate. Except medicine, well, it's been left behind. Consequently, at a time when medical science and practice models are changing more rapidly than ever, we have an education system with a constrained capacity to innovate and scale. We're putting learners at risk of being left behind because we, as a community, are behind. Instead, this is our vision for where we need to be. This is how we need to seize upon the affordances of the digital age to rethink information exchange in medical education. We need an ecosystem for medical education that's collaborative, that's evenly distributed, and that's adaptive. Today, we're sharing our concept that's situated at the intersection of those needs. So we envision a national exchange for medical education resources. It's one part information repository, one part learning management system, and one part social network, where medical schools and faculty will publish their full curricular materials as free, open access content for use by educators, curriculum developers, and learners. The implementation of an exchange accelerates diffusion of innovations among institutions, enabling medical curricula to keep pace with evolutions in medical science and health systems. It pivots medical education from out of sync and out of date to coordinated and current, preparing learners to meet the challenges and opportunities of a profession that is always changing. The exchange capitalizes upon the affordances of the social web by making content instantly available. While drawing upon the wisdom of crowds to highlight its, the materials educators and learners find most effective, learners will assess student centricity and quality of content through comments, votes, and social metrics such as link shares, view counts, and retweets. Students can become stakeholders in their own education, making and contributing, not just passively consuming. Their feedback will ensure that medical school curriculum has maintained a sensitivity to what patients. And future doctors need, including qualities that people hope to see in their healthcare providers. Meanwhile, post-publication peer review of learning resources by educators and clinicians will vet quality and accuracy, ensuring that only the highest quality resources bubble up to the surface for adoption. Now, we hold the core belief that when individuals with their own aspirations and talents come together to build upon each other's work, we drive toward a greater goal. To make this possible, all resources will be made available under a Creative Commons license. This license grants the rights to share, use, and build upon a work, while also requiring attribution in any use or derivation thereof. Using the Creative Commons license allows for the necessary collaboration and iteration on resources, while ensuring educators and institutions maintain control of their works and receive recognition for their efforts. Faculty's contributions will demonstrate measurable impact in medical education. Conferring new academic capital and recognition. Now, how does the national exchange transform medical education at the individual school level? Well, individual schools will retain the ability to select among publicly available materials in the exchange, or to develop and publish their own. This flexibility allows medical schools to experiment and adapt as laboratories of curricular innovation, but concurrently provides encouragement to refocus their efforts on developing active learning approaches. Around existing content. So, when 140 plus medical schools no longer have to develop 140 plus parallel lectures on the same topic, it really liberates us. It liberates the nation's outstanding educators to then go forward and to develop. Er, oops, there we go. Liberates the nation's outstanding educators to really explore emerging ideas, to push the frontiers, to pilot better teaching techniques. Because instead of building in isolation, you're building in collaboration. You're shifting the emphasis from keeping up with the challenges of the last generation and the last decade to anticipating and seizing the opportunities of the next one. So, how do we really make this vision for medical education, a collaborative, open national exchange, a reality? So, introducing new technologies to medical education and healthcare has never been easy, and we're all familiar with that here. There's plenty of these Miss Faversham's. There's also been needless technolo technological complexity due to a lack of user-centeredness. Sometimes, medicine's most transformative technologies really can be profoundly simple, straightforward solutions 
that address immediate needs, improve outcomes, and drive institutional change. Things like the perioperative checklist, motivational nudges for health behavior, and now a curriculum exchange. So we often get bogged down when we think about technical problems, and that really inhibits our ability to innovate without boundaries. Unfortunately, all the technical abilities that we need are already here. So we'll build on proven solutions for other industries that have demonstrated fundamental principles of human nature. Google Drive, for example, has shown us how we can collaborate in real time across time and geographic boundaries. GitHub is at the epicenter of open source software, allowing people to generate great ideas and exchange them. Reddit has shown us a platform for bringing out the best ideas and crowdsourcing them through upvotes and downvotes to make sure the best concepts rise to the forefront. So if the problem isn't yet technical, what is it? Let's look at this fairly typical scene at a local coffee shop. Everyone's hard at work. They're alone, yet they're together. And this is the status quo for medical education development today. We have a different thing in mind. There we are. Instead, we have something in mind like this, an entire community that comes together to build something greater than any person could accomplish by him or herself. Achieving this vision will require a culture change among educators, clinicians, and administrators. We have to abandon our instinct to protect our efforts as proprietary content and rather invite access, adaptation, and collaboration. So a lot of people might wonder, what's in it for me? Why should I share all the time and the resources that I've invested into my curriculum development? So we talked earlier about Coursera, which is one of the many platforms that's out there delivering these massive open online courses. These have really demonstrated the potential value of universities sharing their best work to better the world. In the process of doing social good, these institutions are strengthening their brand, strengthening their reputation, and attracting future students and faculty. In medicine, we've got to go a step further. So in medicine, we need to go a step further. Our mandate in medicine really calls on us to align our activities and our incentives in the care of the human being. Sharing resources to improve the education of all medical students, and not just those at our home institution, really embraces this mandate by demonstrating a commitment to improving the health of every person everywhere. What about an example of this commitment in medicine today? I'm probably preaching in the choir here, but who's heard of FOMED? Yeah. All right, a little bit. That's better than I would have expected at any other academic medicine conference, so cut it there. So FOMED stands for Free Open Access Medicine, and it's a grassroots movement that's a little bit like this. So it's about doctors, nurses, students, and other professionals from all around the world working together. So the emergency medicine and the critical care communities have come together to establish a globally accessible crowdsourced educational adjunct that provides a contextual and asynchronous content that augments traditional educational principles. FOMED, and the numbers speak for themselves there, is really a testament to our conviction that open exchange of educational resources is an opportunity and not a threat. FOMED is a conversation space for continuing medical education across social media, blogging, and podcasting platforms. It's a proof of concept that shows us that by putting our ideas out there, we can strengthen our own brand, strengthen our institution's brand, and benefit others like us elsewhere. And if you're still not convinced, I offer this. These are the metrics of of Twitter activity on FOMED for the last week. And so I ask you, when was the last time that any of your educational efforts reached 17 million people? These are the things we could do if we go beyond our institution. And like we said, the barriers from getting there are mainly cultural. So let's recap. We've talked about the current landscape of medical education, which is slow, siloed, and passive, at a time when other sectors are embracing the open nature of the digital age. We set a future for the vision of medical education that's collaborative, distributed, and adaptive. And we've introduced our concept for a learning exchange that drives medical education innovation to make that future a reality. And we can attain this future if we understand that the biggest obstacles holding us back aren't technical, but sociocultural. So we'd like to close here with a quote from Marion Chinopoulos. It's not about the technology, it's about sharing knowledge and information communicating efficiently, building learning communities, and creating a culture of professionalism.
We believe that together, we can bring widespread innovation to medical education. My name is Amola Dronker. I'm here with Jared Shenson. Thank you for your time. I look forward to creating with you all. All right. Fantastic presentation, Amal and uh, Jared. So uh, we, we've actually had some conversations before on this as well, too. So you'll know this is probably not the first time. Uh, you know, there'll be familiar questions. So um, it's, you know, the, the idea of crowdsourcing medical education is uh, very attractive. Um, and there are efforts underway, obviously, doing that. How do you think schools, institutions, uh, um, um, can potentially adjudicate some of the design decisions that may become. For example, if uh, Stanford wants to contribute, say, a, a PBL or a problem-based learning module on asthma, and but uh, Dell School of Medicine wants to do something on COPD, but they have different views, how, how could this potentially be um, addressed in, in, in the MUSE model? So and one of the things that MUSE really allows to do, and if I'm not understanding the question, just correct me at any point, is that it really allows schools, we'd imagine, to customized to their own needs. So it, the way we foresee this is individual schools would collaborate their content. So if Stanford believe, if there's an expert on asthma education at Stanford, for example, that asthma education curriculum might benefit students elsewhere. Um, but if, we, if someone at Dell Med, for example, finds that that module might not suit their needs, they might want to either adapt the module that exists to meet, better customize and meet their own individual needs or create another one. And so we believe that by having multiple institutions that can either choose to take what's there or to create their own and then feed it back into the exchange, that we can have more of a, a collaborative culture that allows the best products to really rise up to the surface and diffuse out rather than having the status quo, I should say, where people are working in silos and not really moving forward together. Questions? Yes, please. So, One and then two. Please identify yourself. Yeah, my name is Denise Silver. I'm a consultant. What is your next plan to take this forward? I, I didn't really catch what that might be. Because you can go on SlideShare, and I did type in anemia, and there is a ton out there. Are you going to create? I mean, it'd be very inexpensive to create a place. What about FOMED? So I mean, I think as we talked about, you know, the, the technical challenge, and as you alluded to, is none, right? It's it's a cultural thing, and <clears throat> so we we had the fortunate opportunity to talk with um, a number of uh, great educators around the country last year, um, at who were part of the AMA uh, Changing Medical Education Consortium. Uh, and for those who are unfamiliar, it's it's a group of uh, 30 something medical schools who have all been recognized for their efforts to innovate in medical, medical education. There's a lot of kind of broad support from the educators at that meeting. Um, certainly a, a number of people were questioning some of the cultural challenges of how do we overcome these barriers. Um, and so I think, you know, a place like Medicine X is a great point for all of us who are already thinking these kinds of ways to bring us back to our institutions and say, how do we bridge those cultural gaps, right? How do we make a community that is strong enough to say, we will overcome those challenges. Um, and once we have people who are willing to be those, uh, the, the ones who start at that frontier, then you know, it's easy to, to build the technology to support it. You make an excellent point. I think that's really one of the reasons we love coming out here to Stanford Medicine X every time. It's just that we're able to interact with people and broaden our perspectives. I was just telling Jared earlier, you know, we, I, we've both seen countless lectures on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But nothing makes it feel as real as when you hear the patient experience has gone through it. And there's real educational value in that. So absolutely, as we build this out forward, you know, finding a way to really incorporate the patient voice, the caregiver voice, and seeing those as unique perspectives of expertise that traditional medical educators might not have, being, a way to, being able to bring that into the fold is going to be key. Okay. I think we have time for one more quick question. Please identify yourself.
a brief response, please. So I, I think <clears throat> the, the second question is probably a little bit easier to quickly address, and that is that we think that if you can demonstrate social and academic capital by publishing content on the exchange and having it be used across dozens, hundreds of medical schools, teaching thousands of students, that's a much more intriguing case for your academic employer to try to give you academic money, time, whatever, to support those efforts. Um, as, as far as the first question of who do we need to talk to, um, you know, I, th I think it is, it's a both administrative level issue, but it's also of you know, the individual faculty. And it, it's a challenge, for sure. <laughs>